Aloha, spooky nerds, and welcome to Talking Strange, a paranormal pop culture show with the Den of Geek Network, where we discuss the entertainment of the unexplained. I'm your host, Aaron Sagers, a journalist, author, researcher of all things weird. Currently, I can be seen on Travel Channel and Discovery Plus's Paranormal Caught on Camera. And pardon the pun, but this interview is going to be R-rated because we're talking about pirates. That's right. I had to make a pirate pun. On March 3rd, the new comedy series, Our Flag Means Death, premieres on HBO Max. Now, this 10-episode season is from creator David Jenkins and Taika Waititi. Of course, we all know who he is, all of us nerds. And it is very loosely based on the true adventures of 18th century gentleman pirate Steed Bonnet. And if you don't know about Steed Bonnet, after a life, a refined life, he trades it all in to be a swashbuckler. He becomes the captain of his own pirate ship, the Revenge. He struggles to earn the respect of his eh, slightly mutinous crew. Steed's fortunes change after he has a fateful run-in with the infamous Captain Blackbeard, played by Taika Waititi himself. Steed and their crew attempt to get their ship together and survive life on the high seas. Now, the man behind the gentleman pirate is a guy that, if you follow my work, uh, you've, you've certainly seen me interview him a couple times before, and you've seen him all over pop culture from the series Rex to the Jumanji reboots to X-Files, Hunt for the Will to People, uh, What We Do in the Shadows, Flight of the Concords, as well as the host of the long-running Cryptid Factor podcast. And his name is Reese Darby, and we're bringing him in right now. Hello, Reese. And here he is. <laughs> here he oh. is. Hey, man. Uh, so good to see you. Uh, I see um, already New Zealand is well represented right behind you uh, yes. in, a, in the form of a poster. Mm -hmm. So this has been uh, this is a set that I've designed myself for these type of interviews. So you've got a touch of New Zealand there. You've got some uh, board games, a little bit of stuff for, for people to look at in the background. If things get a touch on the boring side, which is what they, they tend to do when I'm talking. I'm already bored with uh, what I said. <laughs> well, what I love about it is I know we're not here to talk about Flight of the Concords, but it's such a, a touch of, of a Murrayism to have uh, a nice New Zealand poster right, oh, yes. right behind it. Yeah. <laughs> I forgot about that. Uh, well, let's talk about, obviously, first off, uh, I've seen the first five episodes of Our Flag Means Death. It's a really entertaining show. I I It's one of the these roles that I could not picture anyone else being in this character of uh, Steed than you. It just feels like such this perfect fit. But I know the development of these of these shows, you know, they're they're twisty, they're turny. How did you come to be attached to this? Obviously, you know, a lot of folks involved in the development of it. Yeah. Um, so not straight away, but I think. Um, David Jenkins eventually got hold of me when he tried out a few ideas, tried, uh, tested a few English men uh, to be this um, chap. And I think underneath the whole way through, he was thinking, you know what? Reese would fit mm -hmm. this better than these guys. And uh, I believe he spoke to Tyker about it and Tyker just said, get him. What are you, what are you wasting your time for? How, you know, so then he approached me and, you know, of course, would I do it? And um, who doesn't want to be a pirate? Uh, you know, so of course it was easy for me. I, I put myself on tape, showed what I would do in the role and that, in that part um, from the little piece of script that he sent through. And uh, it's what they wanted. It's what he wanted. And I guess the rest is going to be history. <laughs> yes. Yes. The, uh, I mean, first off, you, you, they, you still submitted a tape. I mean, you know, the producers, your right. close friends, uh, mm -hmm. and they still made you submit a tape. They didn't ask me. I just love submitting tapes. <laughs> <laughs> I said, yeah, I'll take the part and look, this is what I would do with it. 
just in yeah. case it's not on the right, you know, um, for you. Uh, and and they were very happy with the tapes. And also, therefore, you know, because the production had already gone into the, the writing of it and, and, you know, things like that mm -hmm. already. And so they really wanted to, it, it helped having my voice there. So I believe mm -hmm. in the writer's room, uh, my tape would be running while they're, while they're writing away. I've, I've got a distinct voice to work with. And if you aren't familiar with my work, and of course you are, and a lot of the your audience will be, but if, if you're not, then um, A, what's wrong with you? And B, um, get used to a, a, you know, a different way of speaking and a different way and, and, and a very sort of a, a slightly odd way of, of getting about. And I think I'm completely regular, but a lot of people do think I'm weird. So, uh, well, I mean, one of the things that I love with your career is that you're you're an actor, a comedian that has done so much that you can really kind of test someone's fan base based on what they know and like you the most from, which mm -hmm. is really kind of like a such a, a testament to a lot of the work you've done. But you're also such a busy guy that I, I, I'm kind of I'm surprised you were even able to fit this into your schedule as well as Taika. Like, how did that I mean, was that a bit of a challenge figuring out the time for both you and he to be coming together and working on this? He's definitely the one that is struggling for time. He's working on so many projects um, and I think. He says yes to a lot of things. I say yes to a lot of things as well. We're, we're, we're very much, we get excited by ideas and, and helping to create ideas with other people. And it's what we basically, what we live for. I wake up mm -hmm. and if I've got nothing going on, you know, I'll just get a pen and paper and start writing something. Uh, even if I'm not even going to use it or there's no point to it. I just, it's kind of a, a way of breathing for me is just to keep being creative. Um, it's all I have. Uh, but it's kind of like, so... So he, I think what, from speaking for Taika here, but he found the idea of acting in this as something, as, 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 him, as him having fun, as opposed mm -hmm. to directing and, and really, you know, cutting things together and, and you know, his, his, the stuff he does is, uh, it's, it's huge and brilliant, but can be arduous as well. And so when you're just in front of the camera with one of your best mates, you can actually have fun, have a good laugh, and we can pretend to be pirates. And so it's like we're kids again. And we both look at each other on the set and go, hang on, aren't we both like in our 40s and we're playing with swords? What are we doing? Yeah. I'll tell you what we're doing. We're having a bloody laugh, you know? And um, so I'm glad it worked out. I'm glad I was there. I'm, you know, probably one of the reasons he probably said yes to it is because he'd be opposite me. And so, so therefore, it's forced fun for fathers in their 40s. Yeah. Well, this is, this is the, um, is this the most that you've actually acted opposite yes. him? Yeah. He's and, usually behind the camera, um, throwing jokes at me to try, uh, or just cracking up in general and letting me go. Um, and you know, he does feature in most of the things he does. He right. likes to jump in there and, and, uh, take roles. But this, this was, um, this was, the first time that we were really opposite each other. But, you know, of course, we've hung out many, many times. And so it was very natural for us. And he's playing the sort of the, the brooding, dark villain type. And I'm the, the opposite, the light, foolish, um, naive little angel. <laughs> well, yeah, and speak, I mean, it's interesting because this is a character that did exist. I was, I was familiar with Steed Bonnet because, look, I think, I think when, uh, Maybe it's just uh, men of a certain age when they're when they're boys, they love pirates and they learn a lot about pirates and girls, girls, too. But uh, I loved pirates. I definitely knew about Steed. But how is this this role different for you? And were you familiar at all with the gentleman pirate? Yeah, I wasn't overly familiar with with Steed Bonnet, um, <clears throat> Major Steed Bonnet. I then ended up doing some reading about him uh, to learn really not so much the details of his life, but really trying to get into his head as to why he did what he did. Um, and it made sense to me for someone to be out of their depth in an authoritative role. This is starting to 
sound like some some of the roles I've played in the past, um, <laughs> and also to to have people want to follow you when really they shouldn't be following you. And once again, if one of my earlier characters, as you know, is certainly the blind leading the blind there. Um, why did Brett and Jermaine follow Murray? The guy's a complete fool. Well, Brett and Jermaine didn't really, the characters I'm talking about here, didn't really know too much either about what was going on. They were certainly out of their depth. And so I guess, yeah, this, there were similarities there. So yeah. uh, the main stretch for me was how do I come across very fancy? And it turns out I've had a lot of practice dressing up and um, attending fancy parties. <laughs> so I can, you know, I'm, I'm certainly uh, a bit more rough around the edges than the actual Steve. But um, once I got those costumes on, man, and those high heels, you know, it kind of fit <laughs> I fell in, it all fell into place. Well, yeah, they, I mean, this is a, this is a guy that, yeah, as you said, he's out of his depth, but he's also trying to fit in, but doing it so terribly. Well, you know, he's, he's, he's trying yeah. to be considered a, a, uh, serious pirate, but is doing it terribly. That, there's actually just something so inherently relatable about this character too, because I think in 1770, 1717, right. He, he, uh, was about 30 years old when, but he was having a midlife crisis. He just basically was like, you know, screw it and walked away from his life yeah. to go, to go play. Uh, was that, was that kind of part of your development of the character of finding this relatable nugget to him? Yeah, he's a dreamer. I mean, he, the real character read, too much he loved reading and that's why he ended up putting a, a library on his pirate ship you know and he got that installed in real life and everything like that and it was the only oh, i didn't ship, know that yeah it was the only pirate ship that had the captain had his own library you know and okay. that features quite a lot in our show because steed is so proud of it and no one cares no one cares about reading in those days apart from you know <laughs> aristocracy who do have time to read but of course none of the pirates can really read i think there's maybe one or two uh, in my crew that um would even want to read. Uh, but the thing is, is that he, uh, the real character, and I, and I, you know, going and out of the real one and, and my one all the time, and it gets, gets confusing for me, but he, um, you know, as I say, was a dreamer and, and decided because he, he had, there was no effort to his life. He, he was a wealthy landowner. Um, he was forced to marry someone he really didn't love, as was the the thing in those days, you know, people were put together in aristocracy. You're marrying that person, mm -hmm. you know, it fits with the both families and away you go. We'll expect children, please. And so it happens. And then he's just deeply unhappy, I think, with and, and reading stuff and going, oh, my gosh, I wish I could be part of this adventure. I, I want to feel something. I think he wanted to feel um, alive. And that's part of, you know, the middle age crisis that we all go through. Uh, and if it hasn't happened for you, it, it will, is that you remember when you were 20 and you remember mm -hmm. how you were bulletproof and you could do whatever you like. And then, of course, life catches up with you and all these responsibilities and now you're a dad and, and now you've got to pick the kids up from school, take them, you know, and blah, 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 and you find little nuggets of, of when you can um, dream or that's what the reading is, uh, I guess, in those days. These days, you know, you escape to the cinema or whatever. But... <clears throat> For me, when I would work as an actor and I'd, I'd go away, I did a lot of my filming on, on shows like Wrecked mm -hmm. in, the, in the Caribbean myself and then Fiji, uh, did Jumanji in Hawaii and I'd be in these foreign locations on my own and all of a sudden you feel like you're alone again and you're in your 20s, you know, and you're hanging out at the bar and then, you know, it's fun for five minutes and then you start to think, oh God, I miss the kids. What am I doing here? I, you know, I'm out of my depth. Yeah. Um, so I can relate to that idea, and I and I wonder whether and the and the and the flourish of where we are with with Steed in this in this season, that he's going through the romantic side of of escapism. Yeah. And it's absolutely fun, and he's you know he does the realism does hit him, and and uh, because he's a pirate and there's blood and gore and killing, and then when that hits him pretty far, and it hits him in the first episode. Um, he realizes that he's got to make it. Does he go home and forget about all this? Which, you know, in a modern world, you would do. You go that, you know, or does he stick with it? 
Um, and so, yeah. And and talk a little bit about the people that he's kind of uh, sticking with through this this journey. Are these first off? I I I love the crew. I love the crew of actors that you're working with. Um, are, is is Steed's crew more Black Sails or Muppet Treasure Island? <laughs> The latter, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, yeah, they're they're misfits. They're fun. They're funny, and they um, they're they're sort of on the fence with Steed because he's providing them with um, a wage, which is another thing that the real Steed did. He he paid his his crew. No one else did. You really, in those days, you know, you're, you're in it together, and the only way you're going to survive is by looting and pillaging yourself. And 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 so, because Steed had cash, he would he would give them an allowance, you know. And so they they're onto a good thing. But the other side of the coin is the guy's an idiot. They're going he's going to float them straight into a, a battle that they're going to lose, uh, and they're going to die. So, but at the same time, there's a sweetness about this character, which which brings me back to. Um, my mum and some of the outfits remind me of when I put these things on that I look like my mum. And I felt like that a little bit with the Concords as well, that I was sort of a mum character mumming these, you know, like I don't, I don't use dad. I use mum because I'm a mum's boy and I, I, I relate to mum more. And it's kind of that, that kind of, he reads some stories at night and there's a sweetness to, there's a nurturing quality, I think to Steve. He, he does care about these people. And so they start to see that and they go, oh, maybe we should stick with them. Um, so they're, they're, they're all at a kind of a, um, uh, a battle with themselves as to whether they should, they should stick with Steed. Yeah. And, and it's not really a spoiler to say, well, we, we have uh, the great actor, Rory Kinnear is on the show as well. And, Without giving too much away, talk a little bit about the relationship between Steed and uh, Rory's character. So he's really important because he comes from Steed's past and it's his past catching up with him. And he has to make a decision too, where is he going to be with the pirates or should he be with you know, the British who uh, he was, he was educated with and he can relate to more. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that gives him a really powerful decision to make at that point. And, you know, it's, it's without giving too much away, um, fun to watch what happens in that regard. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, we do know, we, we do know that Taika plays uh, Blackbeard and, uh, there is a journey of sorts between these characters, but can you tease out a little bit about the meeting between Steed and, and Edward Teach? Yeah, I think it kind of happens as per it did in history, really, where it's um, it's over a battle and it just, uh, we, we change it slightly because I think they met... Um, in the Isle of Pirates, uh, the famous get together where they, I think Nassau is the, is the island where they basically yeah. created a republic. And um, I think back in the day, Steed was there. Uh, he was actually wounded. And uh, we, we go through that in our show as well. Um, and he comes across Edward Teach. It's just a complete chance meeting. And that's what happens in our show as well. And it's two characters who didn't realize didn't realize they needed each other um, until it happens, and then that we see that one who one who's sort of over his life, Blackbeard is just nothing's a challenge anymore, and he's you know really running on empty because he's just not excited. And you look at that, and the same this comparison to where Steed was when he was in his home married life, over it running on empty, nothing else to excite him, changed his life. So it really, um, it made sense that when Edward Teach meets Steed, someone who really shouldn't be in this pirate world, that he's excited by this lunatic, because what are you even doing here? And with all his fancy, lavish trappings um, that you would normally get if you were lucky enough to, uh, you know, loot these things after years at sea, 
this chap already has them already and he's turned up with them and he's yeah. prancing about with his style and his grace. And um, it's almost like he's not even, he's certainly not in it for the, for the, for the desperation and the, and the, um, the looting. So he blows Edward Teacher's mind because it's like, what is this? And so he then just invests himself into discovering what is going on with Steve and is there something behind it? You know, he doesn't trust him. Um, but then they start to connect and get a, a, a friendship. Yeah. Uh, and again, I think there's elements of this. If you take away the bloodshed, there's, there's this, this is a story that's in a way could be set in any time frame of a sort of a trust fund baby that realizes he's had it all, but never quite lived. And then, uh, seeing the grass on the other side. And, and meanwhile, there's sort of this rock star of the pirate world that comes along. Uh, and, you know, he might be thinking his own, ha having his own feelings about his life as a pirate. Is this the, is this the, um, I guess, the most intense kind of costuming that you've had to do? Because it is, it is quite a, uh, a period piece. Absolutely. I mean, I love, period shows that's pretty much all i watch uh i don't know what that says about me but i love the complete fantasy of putting crazy items on that you know you wouldn't when we look at it today you think why would you bother wearing all that but i love it because it's just so out of the normal i mean these days the world we live in you know you know you might sort of think for 30 seconds about what t-shirt you're going to put on but that's about it yeah uh and so as an actor as someone who's a for for my whole career has um made up stories and acted things out on stage and imagined a crazy imagination actually being able to sort of live that um through putting through the extra details of putting on these amazing garments it was it was uh really really fun i mean it took me a while to sort of get used to these quite high heelish boots that he wore with his dainty bows. <laughs> uh, I, I, I slipped over quite a few times. Um, but once I got the hang of it, yeah, once I've got that stuff on, I mean, I'm steed. That is it. You know, I can't, I'm not me at all. And it really helped. And honestly, if you're going to make a period comedy, you've got to, you've, the, the, the devil is in the details and you'll see that on the set and on the clothing. And when we looked at each other and we were like, Oh my God, this is real. We have to live up to an act as well as the things that we're wearing. So it was, it was, it, the pressure helped. Yeah. If we were just in some, um, you know, loose light or cheap, uh, cheesy outfits that sort of were a nod, but look, would look ca cartoony. We, would give a cartoony performance and then we wouldn't be able to sell the story properly. We, it, it, it was, it was quite an undertaking. Um, but I think, I think the results will show. I, and, and this is a guy, Steve is this, this character that, whereas he's surrounded by people that are just grimy and, you know, their teeth are falling out, everything, you know, the open sores, that kind of thing. He's wearing white, He's wearing very uh, uh, fanciful outfits, but that's what the, I mean. The, the famous uh, illustration of Steed Bonnet is is exactly that. Yeah, and, exactly. And, I think and, I think you know when people in those days, if they had like he wouldn't have thought twice about what he was wearing. It's just you you have it. You have the wealth. These are the garments you attain, and and so that's what you wear to wear anything less would be like oh gosh he'd feel naked you know and mm -hmm. i think um he looks at these other chaps and he doesn't you know he knows they're not the same class but he can see through that can see through that and he's the captain he's in charge of these people he knows that these guys are going to save his life hopefully um but as we see you know he does try to once, once the once the um, relationships start getting closer with 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 all the crew, he uh, shows them the fancy ways. If if anyone's interested, and you know, usually they aren't, but some are, and he he <laughs> he does dress them up at some point, um, of which they kind of 
don't really get away with. But yeah. uh, the uh, well, I mean, it seems like some of them are a little bit more uh, willing to to accept uh, that that uh, nicer, the finer things, I guess, uh, as we go on. I, I and I'm curious, is this as much as you can say this is a 10 episode season because you're busy, because Taika is busy? Or did you approach this as just a self-contained story or is this the kind of thing where you you feel like you could continue on with? Oh, I think we can continue on. Absolutely. I mean, if this is going to be the hit I'm expecting it to be, then I think fans will want this to carry on. Um, I certainly will. I, uh, I think it's, it's, it's such great escapism. And we deal with modern themes in the show, so it's not as if we're just doing an oldie worldy thing that uh, you know is inappropriate in a lot of ways because the world is so different these days with yeah. modern modern themes into it so i can't wait for people to to see that and and for and, and to see where else we can go with it there's a character played by ewan bremner uh that it took me a moment to recognize him but of course he's from you know we know him uh from train spotty and so many other roles but his character's name Buttons. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> this name means something, Reese. What's uh, Tell me a little bit about how you got anyone that knows your work, anyone that yeah. knows the cryptid factor, knows Buttons. How did there come to be a character named Buttons? That is weird, right? I did think about that. Look, I don't have, honestly, I don't have anything to do with that. that is really? Yeah. I was just like, and, and he said, and by the way, you know, your, your, um, your second mate or first mate, uh, is is Mr. Buttons and I said, well, hang on. In real life, my my first mate is Buttons, and so it's just one of these weird synchronicity synchronicity moments where things come together. Um, and I did ask him, I did say to him, if you if you listen to the Cryptid Factor, do you know about the famous actor <laughs> Buttons? And of course, Leon, who is Buttons, my my actual yeah. mate um, in real life, uh, was like, oh. What is that being designed for because of me? So you know, there's you're not the only one that's sort of thought of that. Um, I just I just don't know. I think I think it's just a great name, and I think it was a coincidence. But yeah. I look at it as a sign for sure, because I have it, that kind of um paranormal mind. Wait, uh compare and contrast the two buttons, buttons versus buttons. How are they similar Very and different? different? Very di I mean, honestly, the, uh, I mean, Ewan's character is, um, the only similarity is that he, I guess he's, he, in, in his head at least, knows, thinks he knows what he's doing. He's an old pirate that has been around for a long time, is seemingly unkillable. He has these, you know, ridiculous uh, teeth that he puts in his mouth, which are like, like, um, sharpened versions of what Jaws from the Bond movie mm -hmm. Bond movies um, yeah. had and he's you know he gets to speak in his thick Scottish accent which is just so awesome um, now you look at my friend uh, he's definitely more of a, a, a tech nerd he's brains from the Thunderbirds you know so he he would probably be the engineer on the ship um if anything so he'd be the one that would be fixing everything as we're in the middle of a battle uh, yeah. yeah i always think about that with leon you know i used to watch that movie um gravity where mm -hmm. you know that with sandra bullock and the the ship's coming to uh, she has to deal with leaving leaving a, a spaceship and i think she yeah. gets to get into a russian one and then or was Chinese? I think it's Russian. I can't remember. I think it's. I think it's. I forget. But I know. I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Just to figure it out, and I think that's that's what that's Leon. He would be able to push those. That's why it's called buttons. You know, he would be able to work it out. Just as soon as he sees buttons and knobs and dials, he can work it out. Like I throw him in a Spitfire cockpit, and he'll be able to land it. I just um, don't. I don't know how he would survive as a pirate, though. Yeah. This, well, for a start, there's not many buttons. No, there's, there's a couple of levers, but he'd be down. He'd be, uh, and there's no engine, by the way. So I don't know what I'm talking about there. It's, it's a sailing ship. Although, you know, I know we're talking too much about Leon now, but why not? 
he he does have sailing skills, so he can he can sail a ship. Any moving vehicle, he can he can um, he can dominate. He can propel. Okay. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I the the uh, since you talked about uh, your paranormal mind, and now we're talking about Leon, uh, the cryptid factor. Seventy-one episodes. Uh, the last episode was just uh, January twelfth, I believe. And wow, you guys, uh, you keep trucking. I think it's been what twelve years. Uh, yeah of the cryptid factor this is really this continues to be despite the fact that you are all uh, uh you leon dan uh you're all busy you somehow managed to still eke out a episode periodically now by the looks of it that's which is a good schedule for you uh, yeah <laughs> this what what has been the intriguing conversation lately uh between the w w between you three What's been the thing that uh, you guys have really been enjoying talking about the most, would you say? Well, it's been hard because we, of late, we have been really busy. Um, yeah. And he's been, like, Leon's been back in New Zealand. Dan has been uh, very busy with No Such Thing as a Fish and touring and so, and also his, uh, his two kids um, that he's dealing with, young mm -hmm. childhood uh, stuff, parenting. Um I've been a little bit less busy this year, uh, just sort of, but when we get together, I guess it's where, you know, we, we, we always talk about, um, the, uh, the UFO crisis, uh, you know, something that would, yeah. it was built up, built up. And then the, the thing came out, um, really nothing came from that. And now we're all kind of going, okay, so what's the next step where, you know, we're still being um, uh, sort of drip fed little information, um, but it feels like things have run a little bit dry, to be honest with yeah. you, at the moment. And even when we're looking at cryptid stories, there isn't much. I felt like it's weird because during the the first year or so of the pandemic, and this thing is still going, um, you know, there was quite a lot of cryptid stories, but of late, I, is the last the last show we did it was it was a struggle to find stuff um so yeah and to be honest my head's been so much into this pirate show in the last few weeks i can't i can't pull anything else out of my head right now yeah you're you're too busy with pirates and not thinking enough about aliens <laughs> yeah the, the the uh because as adult men that's that's totally yeah, natural for us yeah the weirdness <laughs> I, I think it's because of the pursuit of weirdness that I've somehow avoided a midlife crisis because I'm still pretty much doing, uh, talking about the stuff that I loved as a kid. I think that you helps go. you avoid the midlife crisis. Yeah. And if you get to escape and do some UFO conferences or Bigfoot conferences, I know these things are still happening. I still get invited to these things. I still want to yeah. go to them. Um, but I just, I, you know, it's the pandemic means you just like, you can't even, you don't even want to go near a plane until this whole thing's over. It's yeah. just a real pain in the ass. Um, but I'm glad that the world's continuing. And I think things will pick up again as, as this, as when we get to endemic, which yeah. thank God is not, not too far away. The, uh, you know, just kind of circling back for a moment to the, the uh, alien, the, the declassified report, I don't even know what disclosure looks like anymore. I, 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 I do think that sort of the door was kind of cracked open and then slammed shut that it was just like, here, here's a little bit of info and that's it. Yeah. You guys are good, right? Okay. We're done. I mean, what do you think disclosure looks like? Is it going to come from governments or is it have to be forced by the people or what do you think? I've got some crazy theories, but look, the thing is, is that I think you're right. They did open the door and they opened the door and they said, this is all real. This is happening. This has been happening forever. And we just wanted to make sure you guys knew it's all real. Uh, there's a, there's a report coming out. That's going to really give you nothing, but uh, we'll leave it there. And I think the door hasn't sh shut. I think it's just left. There's like, just, I'm trying to get my fingers right. And right <laughs> just there. align them perfectly. Yeah. yeah with the camera um, is that it's like that um, it's, it's open. You can look through, but you can only, you can look through and you can see that it's real, but you're only seeing what they're revealing. And mm -hmm. so but I don't think it's shut. I think it's, it's the dialogue has strengthened uh, and become, uh, you know, something that people can openly talk about in the last few years since 2017. And so to that end, I think, it, 
you know disclosure is happening but it's 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 going to take time to we'll just pull that door even further apart and so um just when i said i had crazy theories if if things do lead to a, a terrible disaster with with a war in europe for example we may see way more uap situations go down because you know the fact that they're here and have been mon monitoring us for years and are always hovering around nuclear sites when 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 we're playing with our weaponry and are mm -hmm. saying hey 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 stop that you know what better way to figure out and i don't want a war by the way but if anything does happen if there's any kind you know we may see a lot more uh evidence of what's going on and then if we know more more evidence may be revealed as to you know can they can they stop uh can they help us help humanity stop a conflict i mean i don't know i'm just talking crazy now but well i mean you're talking to the right person but exactly i mean i figured that <laughs> I mean that's that I mean that's that's assuming uh that's assuming that they just don't decide to come in and say all right well, you you had your shot we're running the joint now. Uh, yeah, that, well, that could be it as well. They're like are you kidding me? You got you guys you idiot humans are going to do another war. We, that is not the direction we want to go. So maybe and to that end they might come out at the last minute and go okay, stop it please. Remove the tanks. We're going to, you know, gonna, yeah. we're going to use our laser beams to sort this this shit out if you guys don't um, yeah, I think that also on the in the media, like the amount of documentaries and and TV shows and things that have happened in the last couple of years, has been really astonishing too. It's it's um it's, it's certainly ramp, ramped up. Yeah, but and there's a couple of good ones out right now. Um, I think they just dropped today. I, I had already seen them about the abduction stories of both Betty and Barney Hill and then Travis oh, Walton. Right. They're on discovery plus and and the way they're treating them is yeah there's some sensationalism with it but it's actually an interesting telling uh i don't know if you know ben hansen he's involved with that one and it's um i would recommend checking those out i'm 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 uh somewhat uh surprised that you said uap instead of ufos reese I, I don't know if we should be making uap happen i i feel like i don't know i'm still a ufo guy yeah oh so am i but it's a cooler, it's a much cooler um, thing to say. But I guess what, what UAP does is it broadens the scope of uh, people to actually accept it. Um, it. It removes the stigma. So if, if that can advance this whole uh, thing that we're into to, to being more acceptable, then I'm all for that, you know? Yeah. I, I meet guess, people at parties and I, I start talking about UFOs and they go, oh my God, does he really believe in that stuff? You know, I think less and less now when you talk about UFOs at parties, people are, they're not, they're, they're sort of more coming in and going, oh, okay, yeah, you're talking about that. Yeah, I'm interested in that. These these UAP, especially if you use UAP, because it makes it sound as though you've only just cottoned onto it when right. really, when really you've been a fan since you were eight. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know that, I mean, especially in the entertainment industry, I don't know that I run into too many people and I'm not moving in the same circles as you, but it, when I go to events, when I interact with people, I don't run into a lot of people in, in the entertainment industry that are really pushed back on it and really reluctant because, I mean, the job itself demands some level of creativity and openness, right? Yeah. I mean. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. I think a lot of people in the arts industry um, are fully on board or, or, or always have been because yeah. it's that it's that um, that dreamy lookout kind of mentality. You know, we don't have our heads down um, too much. We're sort of our, our um, we have hopes hopes mm -hmm. in the clouds of of things that might happen. You know, as an artist, I like to take risks and and dream that maybe I'll make it one day. And if I if I didn't have that in my head. You know, I'd still be um, a soldier in the New Zealand Army, carrying howitzer shells around. Yeah, I did that. I did that. I did that for a little bit. That's right. Oh, I, I my, know. My big you, muscly arms. You, uh, you had, uh, you had uh, some security clearance as well, if I recall from top, our uh, top secret. Yeah, yeah. Uh, man, if that, I could that's... go back to those days now, if I still had that clearance, imagine what I could find out. I wasn't even this thinking is... about. UFOs back then. I was too busy like learning Morse code. 
Uh, my see, my conspiracy theory with you is that this is all this is all what is the that movie Confessions of a Dangerous Mind that this is all just a front, the whole actor comedian yeah. thing that you're just deep undercover <laughs> as it, it's, it's 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 deep state Darby here. Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, you might be right. You know, I'm 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 pretty uh, pretty tight with Jacinda, the prime minister. Um, I could be over here just. Just sort of getting into the hot into Hollywood, just to open a few doors and find out exactly what's happening, just to become the New Zealand ab ambassador for the uh, UAP uh, International Conference. I well, you and I know you legitimately are tight with her. I I mean, look, tell her she doesn't know who I am, but I say hi. I would I I want disclosure, but man, I would love to meet her because I just I, I I find her so inspiring. I find her being incredible uh person and leader so um i don't know she yeah find I'll out. Pass yeah yeah i'm sure you know tell her i follow her on instagram i'm sure she'll follow <laughs> me back uh before i let you go i every time i do interviews with people i try to just uh, solicit some fan questions and something that has come up multiple times with you is do you believe in ghosts and i and i know we've talked about this mm -hmm. This is a topic people keep bringing up. So mm -hmm. unfortunately, yeah, I mean, like, well, anytime I interview you, uh, but so say it again, say, you know, what, what your uh, stance is on this. Yeah. Look, I, I do believe in them. I do believe in them, but I, I just can't be bothered with them. And, and it's because we, we decided on the cryptid factor not to deal with ghosts because there was so many other uh, shows and, Mm -hmm. you know dealing dealing with that subject matter and and uh, we would watch the shows the ghost hunter shows yeah. you know with the there's no there's no lights there's the uh, people running about right. in the dark with cameras bumping into things and listening to a noise and okay. it just yeah i think it was there's this over, there was just too much of it and i've had ghostly experiences myself and so i that's why i have to believe in it and i do believe in this um this spiritual side of what happens to us i don't really understand it um as any of us do any of us but mm -hmm. i i think um the energy within us can does go on and it maybe does get trapped here yeah uh, on some instances and um i just think that it's so difficult to get a tangible hold uh, of, of those entities um that um <clears throat> it's not as fun for me as as the physical beings of the cryptids yeah. um yeah i well i i will say that uh i when i was uh researching things for uh our flag means death i was also going down the rabbit hole of old nautical ufo sightings and there are a lot of them i don't know if steed ever had one but uh you know, it was just an interesting rabbit hole. On the show, that's a great yeah. idea. Yeah, they do. They uh, have, yeah, there's yeah, people are sailors of old age, old oldie worldy times have seen lights in the sky. I think Christopher Columbus. Uh, yeah, yeah, he recorded he was, uh, it. He witnessed lights in the sky as well. Yeah. Well, my friend, uh, we are out of time, but I appreciate you chatting with me. And look, anytime you want me on the Cryptid Factor, you just let me know. I'm always promoting something. But uh, in the meantime, you, sir, uh, again, I really enjoyed Our Flag Means Death. Three episodes premiere on March 3rd on HBO Max. Three episodes on March 10th. Two episodes on March 17th. And then two episodes on March 24th. And meanwhile, the Crypto Factor is still trucking, still going on. 12 years strong. And uh, Reese Darby, I thank you so much for your time. And just best of luck with the show. Again, it was just it's really great. And clearly, you're having a good time doing it. Yeah, no, I'm 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 loving it. Uh, I've seen the uh, the trailers and stuff. I haven't watched many of the episodes yet. I'm waiting for them to come out. Um, but it it's one hell of a ride, and I'm very very proud to be on it. Well, five episodes in, I'm 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 all in. I'm on board, you might say. Awesome. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> all right, thanks, Reed. I know you got to go, and uh, hopefully we'll get to chat again soon. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you all for joining yet another Talking Strange. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a review wherever you check out your podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Spotify. And please 
Give me a follow on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, Patreon, at Aaron Sagers. Watch our interviews at youtube.com slash Den of Geek US. And if you have any guest suggestions, please let us know. I want to hear from you guys, and I want you to be part of the Talking Strange community. Hashtag Talking Strange and also Talking Strange on Twitter and Instagram. And until next time, be kind, stay spooky, and keep it weird. Thank you.